Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Liron, for the introduction. I'm Dominic. I work in the Chrome team. I work on fonts and text processing as part of the Chrome layout team. And today I'm here to give you an update on font variations in Chrome. To, to start, let's look back a little bit. This is um, Bedard presenting the demo I hacked up for a typo in September. And you see like the little blue Chromium icon in the top, which means that it was my, my own personal development version. And the number of users for this version was two. It was Bedard and I. Um, so today we're here a bit later. Let's look at what has changed and how many users can use it today. Before we dive in, I'm going to do a bit of an excursion into Chrome's reach to give you an idea of how many potential users there could be in the future. And um, to explain how you can get involved, I'm talking a little bit about Chrome releases. Uh, and then we dive into Chrome variation support with a demo. And then I'm going to explain to you how you can get testing yourself. And we've seen some of this in the past few days, um, but sort of just give you a quick three-step recipe for, for getting started. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of time to explain about the details of our solution, and I'm going to explain a little bit about the next steps we plan in development. So to start with, talk about um, Chrome's reach. Here you see uh, uh, the VP of Chrome Engineering at the Chrome Developer Summit in November 2016, explaining that we have 2 billion active users. So that's a really large number, and a lot of those users are actually on the latest versions of Chrome. We have 58% desktop market share and 52% mobile market share, according to statistics from net market share. So if it, it means that when we start shipping variation fonts in Chrome, there's going to be a really large number of users that will be able to use it right away. Let's talk about Chrome releases. Um, from the left to the right, we have Chrome Stable, Beta, Developer version, and Canary. Stable is the current recommended version. It's fully tested and has gone through thorough internal QA. And um, so it's the recommended version for everyone to use on a daily basis. The Beta version is the version that's going to be the stable in the next six weeks. We have a six-week release cycle so um, I think the beta version is getting sort of forked next week. Uh, then it's matured in an old cask and tested, and um, we do some tweaking on it. And then in about six weeks later, it's going to be our next stable version. Developer version and canary versions are the bleeding edge. It's sort of rocky territory there. It can be a little bit unstable. Features get deactivated and activated. So this is, this is sort of um, our testing releases. and where you can try out things that are just in the making. We ship Chrome on a number of platforms. And sort of on the left side, you see Chrome OS, which is the operating system we use on Chrome OS devices, like um, sort of very portable devices, laptop style, uh, notebooks, this sort of thing. Um, then we support Chrome on Windows 7, 8, and 10 and of course on Android and Linux and macOS. And on macOS, we go back to supporting macOS 10.9. So these platforms are a little bit different. Um, Chrome OS, Android are the platforms that we sort of control from the bottom up. So here we control the operating system. And we've been discussing here at this conference, like, do we need to look at the operating system? Do we have to have support in the operating system for font variations? Uh, Linux is also a little bit special in a way that it resembles Chrome OS and Android quite closely. But on Windows and Mac OS, we have some differences, as we will see. So this is the excursion on Chrome's reach and the type of um, releases we do for Chrome. Let's come back together. What, uh, let's come back to, uh, to what happened since ATypeI. So remember, the number of users at ATypeI was two. We developed the prototype. And then we started wondering, what have we been asking ourselves? We asked ourselves, how can we support variable fonts in Chrome so that all our users can benefit from it on every platform that we support? 
and how can we ship it to this large number of users. But there were some challenges. There were, there's no support for variable fonts on Windows 7 and 8. And as you've seen in uh, Ruel Niskens and Peter's presentation, yes, you can access variations in Windows 10 through named instances, but we don't have the level of control to integrate it with like CSS for font variation settings. So we can't programmatically access, um, access the axes. <laughs> and, um, and there's no variable font support on macOS 10.9 through 10.11 in the level of uh, system APIs that we would need. So we were hitting a bit of a wall there. Am I stuck? Can I not ship variable fonts on Chrome because we don't have support for all platforms? So one thing is maybe interesting. In Chrome, we uh, try to avoid fragmentation uh, across platforms. So if we develop a new feature for Chrome, there is really little reason to say we can't ship it on one of those platforms. So it's generally not accepted. So if I go to my colleagues and say, like, look, we have variations on Cortex, on macOS, are we done? And then my colleagues are like, no, we're not done. Um, does that mean that we need to wait for OS interfaces to support variations? And that was on various slides that we saw uh, at um, Typo Labs here. Do we need to wait for the sort of ecosystem of operating systems to start supporting it? Well, that's what we're here for today. Turns out, we don't need to wait for operating system updates. And today we're announcing that we're shipping, um, that we found a solution and we're shipping variation support on all Chrome platforms. <laughs> that's including Windows, and that's including old versions of Windows. I'm particularly happy to announce that we're bringing it to Windows and older versions of Windows because it's a majority of our users or a large number of our users on Windows. And um, we needed to have a solution to address this. Otherwise, we definitely could not have shipped it. And I even got a Windows laptop to present here to today. So how far are we into this mission of shipping variations on all platforms? We're ready so that you can start testing today. Uh, we have the Canary version of Chrome that you can use on Windows and on older versions of Windows on Android, on Linux, and on macOS. And you can download it now and start experimenting and testing your fonts. So the development version we showed at Atypa had two users. And now the number of users that is at least growing to this room and hopefully more. One sort of, um, sort of small information on the Windows Chrome binary size, and it's another thing uh, I'm proud that we don't need to make any sort of big sacrifices here. Um, what did it cost us in terms of binary size that we're very sort of careful about uh, to bring variations to Chrome? And I made a little diagram. So the binary size for Windows uh, Chrome without variations is about 130 megabytes and variation adds 100 kilobytes. It's about 0.08% of the binary size. And uh, it's not fake. Um, um, the trick here is that our PDF viewer inside Chrome was already using free type. And because we are nice to each other at Google and we sort of have a good relationship across teams, we're sharing free type between our PDF viewer and the variation fonts in Chrome. So this is why the binary size increase is relatively small, because we just had to sort of reshuffle code a little bit so that we can share it between PDF and FreeType uh, in and Blink, the rendering engine. So uh, let's, let's go into a little demo. And I'm going to start demonstrating on Android. So here I have a Nexus 6 that's a not too recent phone. It's about two and a half years old. It's in a way no fancy hardware or um, any special tricks on this phone. And it's an off-the-shelf phone in the sense that this is not a development version. It's again a version that you can download today. So here I have a relative, oh, uh, I need to switch. 
So here I have uh, a couple of known demos. So this is not about sort of innovative demos necessarily, but it's just about showing um, that it runs on this phone. So here I have a demo that you've seen before, and it was sort of similar to the demo I presented, or that, that Beta presented at iTypeI. Um, and you see perhaps the cookies of the Buffalo Gull font moving. Hmm? Yeah, let's see. Is this better? Hmm? Yeah, you can. So here you can see the cookies disappearing, things like that, the hooves showing. And this is running on um, the, so this is running on this Canary version, you see the icon there a little bit um, in Android. So the next demo uh, I can show on, on Android is this Noto variation font. It's a little tricky. OK. Um, so here we have the Noto Sans Arabic font. And what I'd like to show with this one is that you can move the sliders here. And you can see, especially in this sort of very bold version, that the sort of um, component placement or the combining marks and at, uh, attachments are done correctly and are moving with the axis changes. We've also been hearing about the uh, Adobe variable font prototype. And um, I have a version of this one on the phone. So here you see the dollar and the cent sign. And um, this is working as expected as well. So we do the um, G sub replacement here when the axes are configured accordingly. No, this is the uh, true type version. OK, um, so this was the, a quick demo on Android. By the way, I also get the um, Zeitung page in the variable font edition now. And um, since I mentioned what I'd really like to show today is also the Windows version. So again, I keep this sort of Chrome UI on the screen. I could make it full screen, but the point is really showing that it's running in this version and on Windows and not really the sort of demo itself. Um, if I find, ah, I found my mouse cursor. Um, so here you can move the sliders as well and see the cookies changing, um, fringes changing, things like that. Same thing for uh, Noto Sans Arabic. And now what you see here is sort of the axis labels at the bottom. This is rendered with direct write, and the variation instance here at the top is rendered using free type. So we have a hybrid stack um, inside Chrome on Windows to bring variations to older versions. Same here. It's running basically the same stack. She's up working as expected. And then I have another demo here um, of Amsterdam, um, where, um, where we have start to have a bit more sliders. Uh, but so this one works as well. And you see the little Google Fonts logo in the bottom. So the Google Fonts team sends their regards, and they're, they're announcing that uh, a couple of variable fonts are available in the Google Fonts early access program that you can use to experiment and integrate in your pages. And um, pages like Access Praxis, they work as well. So then, 
let's, let's take a little step back, and we have seen here on the conference that some people are in the sliders camp, like Bob was saying. Um, we can safely assume that Jean-Baptiste is not in the sliders camp, and I personally, I haven't really decided. And maybe some of you haven't really decided. We, we know it's interesting to have new ways of interacting with variable fonts. But are, yeah. but are you in the sliders camp or are you in the knobs camp? And I made a variable font that sort of <laughs> lets you decide. <laughs> so it has one axis, and it's called the slider knob axis, SLKN. OK. So how can you start exploring? These are all public versions of Chrome. Um, there's no trickery. It's not fake. You can start downloading it. And so the three steps, or four steps, sorry, um, for you to get exploring is to download Chrome Canary version from the website or from the Play Store on Android. And um, you, have to go, you have to do one um, sort of setting there. You go to Chrome Flags and you enable experimental web platform features. Because we're currently not sort of, uh, this, is, this is our safety mechanism for preventing us from shipping it to the stable version too soon. Um, and then you can use Access Praxis, TypeShift app, or your own experiments. So I try to briefly show you how, how you do that. So you search for. Uh, Chrome Canary, and you go to this link, oops, and here you can start downloading and experimenting. And while this worked for a while on macOS, you can now do this on Windows as well. And you can, um, let's see if this works here. So you, you go to the Play Store on Android, and there you see if you search for Chrome Canary, you see the Chrome Canary version available there. And um, while I have an open button here because it's already installed, you will have an install button um, that you use. And then the next step is you go to um, You go to Chrome Flags, and you enable experimental web platform features. These steps are also described on uh, Lawrence's blog post, uh, if I understood correctly. So um, you can find a reference there later. OK, so uh, you, you can use a website like Access Praxis or TypeShift app or you can also do your own experiments if you have some uh, web space. And a very simple example here um, would be to, oops, uh, a simple example here would be to use this CSS import statement. In this case, you can use Google Fonts Early Access to get the Amstelvar Alpha version. And then you define a CSS style, my variation for font variation settings and you should start seeing results in uh, the Chrome Canary version. And we're listening for feedback here. So you can contribute by saying, this is not working in my experiment, or this is working really well in my experiment. Uh, in my experiment. So um, we're listening for the feedback, and we are sort of still in the CSS working group, working on what is the best integration of, uh, of um, variable fonts into the web world. But as you can see now, I would agree that it's coming to browsers first. So a few uh, words on the software architecture, and I've mentioned some of this. Uh, we have these platforms that we need to support for font shaping. We're using half bus everywhere. So we're using half bus on 
Chrome OS, Linux, Android, Windows, and Mac OS. And for font rasterizing for existing fonts, on our own platforms and Linux, we're using FreeType. And on Windows, traditionally, we use DirectWrite. And on Mac, we use Cortex for that through our graphics library called Skia. So for variable fonts, we had to find a solution. And we decided to do a hybrid font rasterizing architecture on Windows. So we're deciding, we're looking at the font, and we're looking at CSS, and do we need variation support here? And then we're going through FreeType, and otherwise we're rendering through DirectWrite. And you could say that in a way we have a hybrid architecture on macOS as well, because we're using half bus for shaping, but uh, core text for rasterizing. There are some limitations with this version. It's currently only tested for web fonts that are declared via, web, uh, via font face. Currently, there's only low-level access to font variation settings. There's no matching for font stretch, weight, and style. Uh, if you try it out on Linux, you need your system free type to be um, newer than version 271. And it's untested on uh, macOS 10.9 through 10.11. These are things that we'll work on, we'll work on next. So what are the next steps? Um, I'm planning to improve the CSS integration. Uh, so complete implementations for uh, older Mac platforms as well. And then we need to decide when to ship it. And I can't make any promises either, um, but I'm, I'm thinking it's maybe two or three Chrome major revisions away. So the current stable version is 57, the beta is 58, the development version is 59. So you can add two or three numbers to that, and that should be a version where we are able to at least ship this sort of basic rasterization and font variation settings support. And there are some sort of other things that we could think about now that we have the free type hybrid integration. Um, we can use free type for additional benefits such as supporting a cross-platform color font format. And then in the future, I've discussed with um, Peter Constable as well, like we, we're thinking to integrate um, a direct write API once something like this becomes available. So wrapping up. Chrome has a tremendous reach. You saw the number of 2 billion users on large market share figures and lots of users on a new version. So there's a huge potential for the number of users on variable fonts. It has definitely grown from 2 to uh, like a potentially 2 billion. Who knows? Chrome brings variable fonts to all supported platforms, to mobile and desktop. You saw the Windows demo and the Android demo, and you've seen Mac demos before. The hybrid architecture on Windows enables variable fonts on older versions, and the public pre-release versions are uh, available for testing today. That's my update on font variations in Chrome, and I'll hand it over to Bedard for <laughs> update on font use. Thanks. Uh, wait, wait. Oh. Let me get rid of this. <coughs> yeah? Yeah. Do you want to go full screen? Okay. Hey. Do you hear me all right? <coughs> Excellent. Uh, yes. Okay, thanks, Dominic. And so, so I submitted this proposal to well, talk at a typo lab six months ago, and Anna kept asking me what are you talking about, and I kept saying, well, updates on variations. So, on if you remember on variation day, September 14th, uh, everything was rosy, and we thought, well, we did it, we shipped it, we it's finished, we can take it some rest. But then heading home, I figured that there's still so much left to do. We, are still, we just have a prototype. We now have to ship it and finish it, and it's so much work going on to be done. And by that point, I had been working on getting some sort of variations uh, going for by two years. So I needed some rest. And I started 
uh, more and more tuning out and not being able to do as much as I wanted. So then, uh, then the Trump thing happened. And then <laughs> there were weeks that I was at the airport uh, protesting more often than going to the office. <laughs> so the end result is, by now, I didn't really have as much to show as I wanted to. So three days ago, I was thinking, OK, what should I talk about then? <laughs> and I was really confused because, OK, now I have a list of things that I did, and I have a list of things I didn't do. But that takes like three minutes to present. Finally, I figured what I'm going to do. I figured I'm going to talk about stuff that I really love, which is uh, solving math equations and coming up with algorithms and speeding them up and using them. So it was all rosy, and I was so happy. I was so excited. And, but then I started preparing, and I figured that I just don't have enough time to prepare slides. So I figured I can use that camera and a notebook and write. And then I started putting content together, and I figured that, well, I need to define what an integral is. Yeah. And then what a differentiation is, and that it's just so much work. I can't possibly do it in 20 minutes. So finally, I accepted that I'm going to talk about updates and scratch the surface of the stuff I like, but take it as a sneak peek preview to a talk I might do next year. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I'm going to cover updates of variations in free time half was fun tools, because the way I think about this thing, that's the open source stack and the open source uh, ecosystem, and they go together. And I sorted them from easiest to hardest to talk about. With free type, it's complete. Like, free type supports everything variations. Uh, thanks, Werner. Thanks, Adobe, for contributing CFF2. And I know, Peter, you are looking at me, a stat table. I plan to put it in Harfbuzz, so, so thank you, Werner. Harfbuzz, uh, so we had the core of the technology ready at ATIPI already. That's what I was demoing. Uh, that's what uh, goes into font variation settings. Uh, maybe more useful for the audience here, HBView now supports slash slash variations. And I can demo that. So anytime you see this capital demo bang, if I forget to demo, I'll just shout. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, no, it's make filing. Well, a fancy version. Here you go. So HPV, uh, that's my debugging tool. If you want to report bugs against Harfuzz, don't report it doesn't work on Android in Safari or Firefox. Test it with your font and check sequence with HPV. If it doesn't work, file an issue, point me to the font and the text that doesn't work, and we take care of it. Uh, so what's remaining in the half side of things, MVAR, I have, it, I have the table implemented, it's just not hooked up. I plan to finish that next week. And named instances, I don't allow uh, enumerating them yet. But that's also something I should be able to fix in, uh, soon. In the font tools part, oh my god. <laughs> Dan Rattigan, thanks for pointing out all the broken things uh, in the opening talk of the conference. So what I did get done since ATIPI is GPOS merging, and uh, my tiny toy tool called varlib.interpolatable. Uh, What's remaining to be done is AVAR generation, MVAR stat, feature generation, CFF2 generation. Now I say generation, 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 because all of those tables are supported, implemented in font tools. It's just that the varlib workflow of building variation font still doesn't generate them. So what I did instead, uh, I took uh, Sasha and Cosimo and Eric from Lokla and I used it. We got together after that 
uh, the first day of the conference and said, well, let's figure out how to fix this. So the GPAWS, and, and we have a plan now, so now I'm going to talk about that. So GPAWS merging, I remember, I still remember like it was a, maybe a year ago or a year and a half, uh, Monotype and Google, we were talking about Noto. Uh, I said I want to take the binary GPOSs of the master fonts and merge them into variation. And Tom Rickner had this really, really suspicious look at me. <laughs> uh, it turned out to be, it's, it's not rocket science. There's no science to it, in fact. It's just such a hairy problem. So for uh, when we're building variations, you have a number from every master. It can be an x value or something. You take the number from every master and combine it and save it. Except for when you have kerning across masters, well, kernings in different masters that don't fully align. So for example, you might kern in one master, but not the other one. When we build the feature file into a GPAS binary, they have different structures. So I could tell designers, go fix your master, or I could do the right thing. So it took many, many, many iterations to get this done, and Miguel, uh, Miguel Sosa was pushing me to, get, to fix this, and Dan was right. It was broken as of two days ago, but I fixed that annoying bug, so it should work now. Um, there's more work to do if, you have, if your original masters had so bi such big care tables that they were using extension subtables, and one of them is using extension and one is not, wouldn't work, but that's also something I can fix. Then A or F, or the plan is, uh, so right now if you use our pipeline, font make pipeline, and if your weight numbers in your masters is stem width or something, then the fonts come out with the stem width for weight axis, which is wrong because OpenType says they have to be the CSS scale. So this is how we plan to fix it. Uh, design space file already has support for this mapping here. By the way, that, that's the correct translation. I, I'll submit a pull request. <laughs> Last time you asked me for a sample, I just, I was being goofy. So, uh, that one, uh, diameter. <laughs> Same width. <laughs> Okay, so this is how you would, you, you would specify that. You say, like, the user visible number 400 maps to my internal masters 90. These numbers are actually from Noto. So the Noto thin one has 26 as the stem width, and 90 is no regular and bold and black. So the masters are named with the stem width, so it's easier to see what's going on, but we want to map them here. And if you want a more non-linear mapping, you can add as many map entries as you want. They don't have to match with the masters. So I can fix a value to generate this, to compile this into an AVAR. So MVAR, again, very soon, it just probably one hour to hook it up such that Varlib fetches the OS2 numbers and the underlying position, fetches them from the masters and combines them and puts them into MVAR. And, uh, hopefully next week. Stat generation. So those of you <laughs> who know me, you know I'd rather kill it. <laughs> but I understand why it's uh, needed. So the question is where should the source data come from? Because it's not in the master, and it's not in design space. Eric and I and others discussed that we will probably come up with a, well, the previous idea was to come up with the XML source format that we then consume, but I think Eric and I agreed an hour ago to just put it in the design space file. So when you have the axis the declaration, you can also name regions of the axis. Okay, so feature variations, again, uh, where should we put it? We don't know. Design space file already has some rules. They align very well with the open type feature variation, so it makes a lot of sense to compile those. But we probably need somewhere else, like in the Adobe feature file. And that's an ongoing discussion. So CFF2, again, uh, we already have the CFF2 
stable implementation from Adobe merged into Font Tools. But there's a lot of cleanup to be done. And then we need to implement it in Valib and implement CFF to CFS2 converter and implement it in the 5T subsetter and in Compressor font mix. So that's uh, much more work to do. But uh, we are making progress. So that's my tool, uh, the tool I'm most interested, uh, excited about. And those of you who remember last year, I demoed the same font. And it had this problem. Some of the component orders were wrong, so the dots would rotate as you interpolate it. And so I wanted to fix that. I wanted to make it automatically, uh, make it possible to automatically detect the wrong uh, orders. So that's why I love solving this problem, because I didn't have to solve the math part, then come up with an algorithm and optimize it. Only then I can use it. And that happened between last year and this year. So going to demo. By the way, my uh, favorite way of calling the subsetter and TTX this thing is this tiny command line font tools. You now can just say font tools TTX something or font tools subset. So. Let me take the TTF interpolator in the regular. So right now, I, I can give you the list of fonts, and it compares each one against the previous one. And right now, it works on TTF and OTF. The plan is to make it work on UFO and Glyph file directly as well, or a design space file. So I do this, and I time it four seconds, not too bad. I report four glyphs that have problems. Or yeah, let's look at one of them. Well, gain that below Arabic. Yeah, that's this character. The code is six F C. So slider demo, 6FC. So these masters, the, the naming is screwed up. They come from glyphs. And semi-bold is actually bold, and bold is black. So the report says this glyph has different component or, or order between bold and black masters. Let's see. So we are regular. And the, the report says, if you look at it, it says that 0, 1, 2 is what you expect. The second and third ha are reordered. So that's my slider demo for the day. So to, to implement something like this, I, I needed to implement a lot of pens. And they are useful on their own, so I'm going to talk about them. There's a recording pen. It does exactly what you expect. You draw to it, and then you can get back the drawing as move to curve to line tools. And then you can replay it to other pens. There's the T pen, which basically multiplexes the drawing. So you can, you draw, for example, the next two, two pens, the per perimeter pen, gives you the perimeter, the length of the perimeter of the glyph, and area pen gives you the area. If you want both of them, you can create area pen and create the perimeter pen, then create the T pen and connect it to both of them. And then you draw the glyph once, and then it goes to both. So I'm going to show you the area pen. Some of you might know James. Uh, he used to work with us on these things. Uh, Unfortunately, he left Google to pursue other interests, non font related. He works with VR now. But when he joined our team two, three years ago, my first assignment for him was go solve this integral to calculate the area of the glyph. And it took us some time to generate, the, to write this code, which looks tidy. Then 
However, to solve this interpolation problem, I needed more than just the area. I also needed the center of math, and I wanted to know how, how, oh, how do I say, how fat <laughs> or thin the cliff is, is it slanted, and I needed more statistics. And that's exactly what statistics uh, is, except that I don't want to sample the shape. I don't want to rasterize and then check every point. I want mathematically solid and analytical solutions. At least I like them. So that's how I learned this stuff. I never learned integrals in high school or uh, university. I, I didn't want to learn. It's only 15 years later that I appreciate it. So I think the rest of this talk, I'm going to talk about integrals. So if you didn't notice, that one is on John Hudson. Who needs an integral display size font? So yeah, demo time. <laughs> so if you know integrals from some education or whatever, uh, an integral over the function, it just adds up that function all over a range of values. So when you apply it to Bezier, this is, for example, the integral that describes the length of a Bezier curve. And you, if, if you expand it to x and y, it looks more like this, and the x and y are bold because they are functions. So. If you solve that integral, you get something like this code, right? This. Or if you approximate it, you get something like this. I, I love this function. This computes the length of a, a quadratic uh, Bezier to a very high uh, approximate, uh, like accuracy. And this one is for uh, a cubic. It's like six lines. I love this. So. That's the kind of fun you, you do with the integrals if you solve them and then write the code, as opposed to not solving the problem and just uh, do the, what we call the brute force solution, which you can see the brute force here. Uh, yeah, the recursive solution. Well, it's not much longer, but it's much slower, like 10 times slower. So for the rest of them, for area and center of mass and uh, moments, I need, it's a much more involved problem. Fortunately, there, there exists this theorem called Green's theorem, which relates, this is Green's theorem. <laughs> what it means is it, it gives us a way to compute a function, to, to sum, to integrate a function over the area of the shape by just knowing the outline and computing and integrating some other function on the outline itself. So that's extremely empowering. That's exactly what I needed. So this is the general form. We need only half of it. So this is what I need to implement. And yeah, that's exactly what I implement. Uh, where are you? So <laughs> yeah, uh, OK, this is the best part. fun. Yeah, this is the implementation of the Green Theorem. So that goes here. So this negative sign you see here, that's this. <laughs> Literally, it, it, it translates to code. But the, so what I do with this, I want to uh, show that one. So there's this package called SimPy. In Python, it allows for a symbolic computation. What is symbolic computation? That's exactly what this is, like x as a placeholder for a value and y. We call them symbols, and then you can do things with them. So sp is now my SimPy module, and it has, I already defined x and y and t as symbols, so you can do that yourself. So I think z. Uh, yeah. So I define z as a symbol. I know it's hard to grasp what's going on. If I try to add one, normally 
Normally, variables have a value, and you add one to it, you get the next number. This time, you get, it looks the same thing, but it's remembering this expression, this, this formula. And I can do things with it. For example, I can say differentiate it. It does. Well, that's not very useful, but. So it, it gives me the, it differentiates. And the more interesting one is to integrate it, right? Is it like that? Yeah. So that learning that I can do these things with SymPy tremendously simplified my life, because before that, we had to go to Wolfram Alpha, type these equations, wait for it to integrate, and then translate the result to Python code. That's how the area pen was written. However, for these moments and other the second moments that I wanted to compute, it's just infeasible. I'll show you why. So this is my green function, green theorem. It takes a function that you want to integrate, that is the, this f. So my f function, let's use 1. If you integrate the function 1 over an area, it gives you the area. So let's see that. And I give it the, the curve that I want. Uh, I can do a cubic Bezier or a quadratic. So let's look at it for a quadratic first. So this is the, the formula for the area under a cubic Bezier. And the P0, P1, P2, P, P2 are the control points, the endpoints and control points. If I do it for the cubic, I get this one. This is the same as the code I showed. That one was handwritten, and this is auto-generated. Now, when I go to the higher moments, center of mass or the variance or the co correlation, let's do correlation. If you integrate the function x times y over the area, you can compute. The, it's called the second, the xy moment. You can use it to compute correlation. Now, when I run this, NumPy or SymPy is going to uh, do the integration and print out the result. It takes many seconds to integrate, but the output is code. It, it's, this is Python code. I can copy it into my code, right? There's a major problem here. It's really inefficient and slow. If you look at it, something like p0 x, uh, dot x to the power of 2, that, that is computed like 10 times. When I have five of this function, it's just, it's, there's a lot of extra uh, work that doesn't need to be done. Fortunately, so let's call this moment. Fortunately, SymPy has this function called CSE, common, uh, common sub-expression uh, sub elimination. And it does the hard job of uh, figuring out how to simplify those things. And X, Y, I think that's it. Yeah, so what it does is, it says if you introduce these extra 50 intermediate variables, then your expression can be written in terms of this as this. In this case, many of the, there's no other repeated sub-expression. Sub so, all I need to do is now convert this to code. I can just print it out as code. So that's an optimizing compiler, compiling to Python as, as, as a, like assembly language. So that's how I generate this. Oh, yeah, let's go back. Uh, paint. So I have a function print green pen. I give it the function, the name of the uh, thing, and it prints out uh, Python code for the pen. Yeah, so this is, this is the printed code for, to compute the second moment, x, y moment, uh, very quickly or very fast. And this is, that's how I generated the pens.moments pen. So this is all generated code. I'm not going to try to write this, but copy paste it from Wolfram Alpha. So that's, what, that's the, where the fun is for me. So with that, 
And this, this made the pens 10 times faster. So if it wasn't for this extra uh, optimization work, that interpolation check for, the, uh, for that fund, instead of four seconds, it would have taken 40 seconds. And I think that's it. So thank you, everyone. And by that, I really mean everyone. Uh, from the fund tools team, from Microsoft, Apple, Adobe, uh, Adam to Adobe, all the collaboration about variation, everyone who presented here, I truly look forward to coming to this conference every year. And it's so exciting to be here, all the sideway conversation and everything. And the cute drawings are <laughs> from my friend Shimona. She drew, she's an art therapist. She drew them for her presentation. And when I was struggling with content, I figured if I show them, no one's going to fall asleep. So that worked, I hope. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. <laughs>